It's a common thief in the cattle industry and a constant battle for producers, internal parasites. Tonight, the team at Merck Animal Health walks us through how to make your deworming program as effective as possible. Well, good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm Janet Adkison. Well, cattle producers battle internal, internal parasites year round and Merck Animal Health, well, they are a leading force in delivering new and valuable product innovations, solutions and services to cattle producers. Well, here with me now is Merck Animal Health Cattle Technical Service Veterinarian, Dr. Jacques Fuselet and Senior Technical Services Manager, Dr. Wade Nichols. Gentlemen, thank you both for taking the time to sit down and join us this evening. We we appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Good to we be here. It. Well, let's start with you. Give us just a little insight to yourself. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So I was raised in the desert of Eastern Oregon, um, where I gained a lot of experience working on several ranches in a feed yard, even working a packing plant, and all that led up to my finishing my BS, which my friends laugh at me because it would take three days to explain my education <laughs> up to that point. <laughs> Had a lot of fun. Like school, huh? Like I did. Well, I like the playing. Uh -huh. I understand. <laughs> so then I went to Oregon State and finished my master's and went to uh, Texas A&M to finish my PhD. And, and uh, since then, uh, Herx hired me and I've been in the business 31 years. And I've gotten to travel the United States and Canada and, and uh, see how different people manage cattle mm -hmm. and, and their operations and learned a lot. It's just, it's been a great career. Does it vary a lot region by region? It does, yeah. absolutely. And what's funny is everybody thinks the whole world is just like their region. Yeah. And so it, it's it's been good. You kind of educate people, and it's, mm -hmm. it's been very, very good. And speaking of another region, <laughs> Dr. Fuselet, uh, Louisiana, that's your ter home territory. Yes, ma'am, it is. So, yeah, my name is Jacques Fuselet, uh, born and raised in the small town of Mamou, Louisiana. Uh -huh. uh, got my bachelor's from LSU. I got, went to vet school at LSU. Um, and they're getting double boarded after that. Um, so I'm board certified as a food animal specialist. I'm also board of theriogenologist, which is a fancy way of saying reproduction okay. specialist. And um, had my own practice for several years. Um, I was on faculty at the University of Illinois for a little while, faculty at uh, LSU for a little while. And now I'm with Merck. I've been with Merck for going on six years. All right. Treating you well so far. Oh, yeah, they're great. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, mm -hmm. we're certainly glad to have you guys join us here this evening. Uh, Dr. Nichols, let's start with you. Uh, cattle producers, like anybody in the ag industry, they want to be as efficient as possible for cattles and, or cattle producers, ranchers, deworming. That's a critical role right there. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So that is, it's one of the main things we can do to improve the margin in the mm -hmm. cattle is to get rid of the parasites for a variety of reasons that we'll go into some tonight. But um, if we look at a little um, analysis that Iowa State conducted looking at a variety of trials and assigning a dollar figure to each one of those technologies. You know, we can look at ectoparasitism, ectoparasitism growth implants, um, antibiotics, and then we get down to deworming. So if you put all those together, it was worth $274 a head. And they determined that of that $201 was the result of deworming. So it's a, it's a practice that we know returns, the return on investment is very good. Um, when we, we get rid of those parasites, we conducted another trial in Idaho, um, very well replicated, randomized uh, trial, where we looked at four different treatments where we had control cattle that did not receive any of those technologies. And then we used GamePro, which is a feed additive that has all of its effect in the rumen by changing the rumen microbial population, you get more digestion. And then the other treatment was Revel RG, our implant, our grass implant, and then we used strategic deworming. So we compared those singly, or with two of those practices, or we, uh, finally we put all three of them together. And what we found was all three of them were additive. So the cattle did not, did not receive any technology, um, versus those that gained, uh, used all three of them, um, there was a 60 pound difference in, in weight when we weaned those calves at 115 days. So all those things are highly productive and, and very good for, for cattle production. And all of that comes down because, simply because uh, <coughs> parasites, of course, impact the animal's nutritional status along the way. They do impact the uh, nutrition status. So if you think about it, that parasite doesn't eat a lot of feed, mm -hmm. but what it does to the animal is, is where we really get, get have a problem. So well, first we look at feed intake, and you can see in this picture the cattle that were dewormed, you know, the grass has been grazed um, slower and, and heavier than those that have not been dewormed. And that's, that's caused, you know, there's some negative feedback with cortisol, haptoglobin, those kind of things that have a negative um, feedback mechanism on, on feed intake. When we don't get the feed intake, then that causes a lot of things, you know, to be 
decrease. So um, <clears throat> if we go back to the parasite itself, when it's in the abomasin, it decreases hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen release out of, to the abomasin, which starts the digestion process, starts to lay open that feed stuff. So when it gets to the small intestine, the enzymes, proteases and amylases and things can break that into peptides that'll, that'll be crossed in the, the gut wall and into the bloodstream where the animal can utilize it. Mm -hmm. um, it those cat <clears throat> parasites also cause an increase in inflammation in the lumen of that gut, so that causes a decrease in absorption in itself in, in getting that. So everything that you have as a nutritionist on a piece of paper and I come to your operation and say, here's what I want you to feed, you know, there's the right protein, right energy, right mineral balance, all that is about 25 or 50 percent less because those parasites are robbing you. So all that that you're putting in them is not what mm -hmm. you think is going to happen and it all actually goes out on the pasture. So. You're not getting the most value out of your not grain the most value. or the pasture. That's correct. So what other things are compromised by these internal parasites along the way? Well when we decrease feed intake everything is compromised. So okay. we, do, we get reduced gain, um, we, we milk production, so uh, the second, tri um, third trimester cows you know, and especially in the fall when they're parasitized, you know, we're not getting the nutrient absorption. So that affects milk production when they do calve. And if we decrease milk production, that affects weaning weights at the end. And one of the worst things is it's, it's, it's affecting the cow's gain, so it's harder to keep her in the conditions where we can get her to breed back on a timely manner like we want them to. Mm -hmm. Um, so we look at gain, milk production, reproduction, then we have the immune system is compromised because the immune system is a cost to the animal and we'd have to have nutrients for that to be an effective immune response. We also have what we call a Th2 and Th1 response. The impact, imp, parasites impact the Th2 response, so it gears that response up so the animal is trying to fight off that parasitic infection which has a negative feedback on the TH1 response which is actually a vaccine response so when you're trying to vaccinate in the face of heavy parasite pressure that TH2 response is decreasing the TH1 response your vaccines aren't going to work as well as you think they are and Dr. Fusilet, my veterinary buddy, <laughs> <laughs> he has a better way to explain it. Okay, we'll, let, we'll bring you into the conversation here. Yeah. Well, what I was telling Dr. Nick was whenever I'm teaching vet students or visiting with producer groups and trying to really get people to understand how this works is kind of think of it as like a pyramid. Okay. Right, the hierarchy of, of needs. And, and it's the same on everything, worms, cattle, you name it. And so reproduction is at the very bottom. It's a luxury. And if there's not enough energy to go around, there's not enough extra energy to supply reproductive needs, reproduction goes down. The next one in line is going to be the immune system. If there's not enough energy to amount of proper immune response and fit to function the way it's supposed to, that's going to be impaired. And all of this happens way before there's any clinical signs, outward signs, shown in the cows or in the herd where you can say, you know, I think we might have a parasitism problem. You, you'll start to see these reductions before any of that happens. And so um, deworming cattle is pretty important to maintain mm -hmm. those important levels. Now, of course, the uh we're talking about parasites, which, you know, we're not necessarily seeing those, needless to say. Uh, a lot of folks may think their herd's okay because their cattle are looking pretty decent, but that's not necessarily the case. No, that's exactly right. So if you're seeing clinical signs of parasitism, emaciation, rough hair coat, bottle jaw, and those kind of things, then you're way behind. You know, they've already, they're, they're exerted their destructive force to an extent it's going to be hard to to get your herd back into a good condition so what we're really talking about is, is trying to take care of the subclinical things so that we get the feed intake and we get the gain response immune response reproduction we get everything crossing that gut wall that we need to in terms of nutrition to help that animal um, progress so really we're trying to reduce the effect on subclinical um, type parasitism and and like i said if, if you're seeing clinical signs, then we need to talk. A little They're, bit overdue then. Yeah, exactly. Now, that being said, we talked about this a little bit beforehand upstairs, but uh, about the life cycle, bring that into the conversation. We'll dig a little deeper later on, but let's touch on that. Okay. Who's the so, lucky one? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, like we talked about, so 10% of the eggs are in the animal, 90% are on the pasture. When, when that female lays the egg in, in, in the animal and then it's excreted through the manure onto the pasture, then that, that egg is hatched in the manure base and then it goes through L1, L2s and L3s as it bolts through their, its progression and then once it reaches to a larval stage, 
then it, it leaves that manure paddy and it starts its crawling up the a grass blade, if you will, and it takes a little bit of water and it needs a water droplet for those parasites to get up and then the cow comes and she consumes the parasites by consuming those pasture blades, grass. So it's, it's, a, it's a process and we try to clean up the pasture, mm -hmm. probably more than we try to clean up the, the cow. We're trying to break the life cycle of that pasture or that parasite mm -hmm. so that we clean up the pasture as well as the cow. Right. Anything you'd like to add to that? And whenever, so it's, it's an immature larvae that mm -hmm. the cattle ingest, <clears throat> and it goes through another life cycle change in the cow. And so there's a period of time that it's in the cow as it's L4 juvenile stage, and then right. once it becomes a mature adult, then it starts to cycle over again and starts laying eggs, which then goes back, and, and the, the process continues. So if we can break that cycle, um, then we'll be in much better shape. And that's really the goal is to minimize the amount of eggs that are put back onto the pasture so mm -hmm. that they can. And you do that before the cattle start looking a little bit rough around the edges. Oh, yeah. So. Absolutely. Now that so means. One of the, I just oh, got to go interject. Ahead. So one of the yep. things that we look at in some of our trials is mm -hmm. uh, we'll look at larvae on the pasture. We'll take a hoop and throw it out and then collect the, the clippings off of that yeah. and actually count larval counts on, on that pasture. So, so, you know, several of these studies that we've done with um, strategic deworming, that's part of our trial is to show how much we re reduce the larval on that pasture. And it, it's significant what we can do when we break that parasite life cycle. It's, it's significant what we can do in cleaning up the pasture itself. Whenever you can show those kind of numbers and stuff, that really kind of drives home the problem that's taking place. And Dr. Fusile, of course, much of the conversation also uh, in recent years has been around the rising resistance of dewormers. Is that something that uh, we know much about right now? Well, what we do know is it's, it's acknowledged mm -hmm. by the FDA and other major you know, uh, parasitology groups throughout the nation that there is some resistance that's, that's being recognized. And it's mostly with these, what's called the endecticides or the macrocyclic lactones with the, the avermectin type, so the, the poor on the injectable <coughs> forms, ivermectin-based uh, dewormers tend to have a, a more of a resistance problem than, than the other classes of, of dewormers, but it, all dewormers are subject to creating some resistance in these uh, worm populations. And so um, it's such an important problem that Merck Animal Health has uh, invested a lot into how do we monitor the efficacy of our dewormer programs. And so there's a, a standardized test called the fecal egg count reduction test. And we <laughs> call it FECRT for short. You know? And um, that, if you're going to, if you're going to give a product, give a dewormer, how do you know if it worked? Well, what is supposed to happen is if you have an impact on the mature worms that are shedding eggs, you should see a reduction in the eggs that's been passed, right? Like Dr. Nichols said, mm -hmm. that whole, with that, that cycle. And so what, what the FECRT does is with, um, the day that cattle are going to be dewormed, you take fecal samples and submit it mm -hmm. and get a fecal egg count. And then whenever uh, 14 days later, you get another set of samples from that, that same group and, and count the eggs again. And you, you need to see at least a 90% reduction mm -hmm. in, um, in egg counts. And as you can see, these indecticides on this, on the screen, we're <clears throat> in the 50% range. So it only, it, it's only working on half of the population right. versus all formulations of Safeguard, you're going to get above 98%, but 90% being the line, the metric to know if, if it's been effective or not. So what's amazing about that, that slide is I think Safeguard for Cattle was first approved in 1983, and I believe we started selling it in 1984. So it's been around almost 40 years, and we still get that kind of cleanup by using fenbendazole. Today we're talking a lot about using combination deworming with it, putting it with a microcytic lactone so we get a little bit probably a little bit cleaner kill with both okay. of them together and we do reduce resistance problems and those kind of things. We're being very aggressive in what we're trying to get done. But it's amazing what Benbendazole has done in the last 40 years. Now you both have mentioned 90%. <coughs> Dr. Fusile, why is that 90% factor so important? That's the, that's the number that the parasitology groups have settled on. That's mm -hmm. how we know that that's an expected kill. If you, if you reduce to where you're only left with 10% or less of the worms that you started with, you would expect uh, minimal effects on the performance of the herd. So if that's, you have to use a measure somewhere, it's very, very hard. 
especially in the southeast, to totally clean cattle out, mm -hmm. you know, to totally go to zero. But if you can get it down to at least a 90% reduction, then that tells you you're going to have a good chance of minimizing the negative impacts, okay? And so that's why if it, anything less than 90 is considered a deworming failure. And at that point is when you need to have a visit with the veterinarian and see if you can come up with a new strategy. Where, where do we maybe go wrong? What can we do to improve this? If you're 90 and above, then the program that you're using right now is working and, and it should be continued. I'm glad that's not how my classes were judged when I was in school. So <laughs> now you mentioned the Fikert test earlier. Uh, whenever it comes to trying to, you know, figure out if you're having a parasite problem, yeah. how do we get our hands on one of these? So Mark Animal Health is, is going to provide would provide them free of charge okay. to, to any producer that, that wants to do this, and um, it's called the Fikert kit. And there's a there's a QR code on the screen. You can use your phone to access it that way. You can go on Google and search free Fikri kit Merck or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Or um, if you know your local Merck Animal Health sales rep, <clears throat> they can get you um, these kits. And they're pretty neat. They're, they're self-explanatory. It has directions inside how to do it. You get fecal samples from at least 20 fairly fresh fecal pats. And then 14 days later, you get another 20. Um, everything you need is is in the the box and there's even shipping labels to the the several patho parasitology labs that we use you pick the one you want put it on there and go it's about a 200 dollars value that merck is willing to give mm -hmm. the free so the industry gets an idea of how their parasite program is is working very interesting now again that qr code that was on the screen you can scan that with your phone just use the uh your camera phone i just learned this while ago i thought i had to have an app to do it but you can actually just use your camera phone and scan that qr code that you see right there on the screen and that'll take you to the website so you can have access to those kits that they're talking about and with that being said we have a video to share a bit more about the feature testing so with that let's go ahead and take a look at that video Producers can now request a fecal egg count reduction test kit free from Merck Animal Health. Merck created this fecal egg reduction test kit, and that's uh, all of our sales reps have it available. It's free for producers and veterinarians to use. And we collect 20 samples. It's just a random sample of fresh manure on the pasture, and that gives a representation of what's going on at a herd level. And 14 days later, we do it again. And, and see if there's a reduction. And we, Merck is maintaining a database and they've been doing thousands and thousands of samples since 2001. So we have a, a very large database that we can dig into and see what the trends are as far as effectiveness of the different type of dewormers out there. The fecal egg reduction test is advantageous and particularly working through a company like Merck where they actually provide these products and this service for nothing. It's able to come through and be able to see how these products actually work and how your deworming program is working. Well, you can certainly see there where the fecal testing would be pretty, pretty important to employ. Talk a little bit about that video there with you gentlemen would. Dr. Pius Lane, go first. So as you can see, the, the form to fill out was included in there and, yeah. and all the little baggies. Um, it's important that you, it's great to wear gloves. Um, we didn't have it in that video, but it's always a good idea to have gloves, but it's neat because you just turn the bag inside out and you grab the sample there and it stays fairly clean. And then you make sure you label the bags and it's a pretty easy process to do. The, the important thing to do is try to get a fish, a fresh fecal pad, if you can. Not one that's all dried and uh -huh. you can play Frisbee with it. It's not right. gonna, the, Larvae won't be there. Anymore. Doesn't accomplish very no, much that way. Much. Yeah. Okay, and Dr. So, Nichols? Well, if you go out and you're actually sampling those herd, you know, if, if you go out where they're loafing and they're laying down and then you disturb them when they get up, usually they'll defecate. You can get, get a lot of your samples that way and just go across your pastures and, and I, pick those up. I and have then, to ask, are we talking about a big old <clears throat> fresh handful or do you need very much? No, just like a golf ball golf size. Ball size. Yeah. Golf ball size, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that way too, when, especially if you're doing cows and calves, you can say, okay, this one's from a cow because you saw her drop it, and this uh -huh. one's from a calf because you saw him drop it. And you can take those, and it's really very important to try to differentiate between the cow and the calf. Okay, well, that's you something you can label it there on the bag before you yes, do it. Right. Okay, Absolutely. well, good deal. Now, what are the type of parasites that we're looking for? And <clears throat> is there, of course, also a seasonality to these parasites? Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, so we're, <laughs> the main parasite we're looking for are GI. Uh -huh. you know, intestinal worms. That's really what we're looking for with these types of tests. 
And there is a bit of a seasonality, and it's going to be a little different in different parts of the country. And so working with your veterinarian to help fine-tune when that is is, is, going to, is important. But uh, just as a general theme, in spring and fall, however that falls in your neck of the woods, whatever months encompass that, that's, that's a heavy parasite time frame. Okay. And so there's often going to be uh, programs tailored around those times when, when you're going to be um, given a dewormer. Most it, tuned in. As Dr. Fuselay said, it, it's going to change depending on your geographical location. You know, and, and, you know, we, just, we just try to look at 26 to 28 degrees as a freezing type moment. We'll, we'll arrest some of that transmission. And then when it gets to be 50 degrees for a period of time, that's when they'll start reappearing again. So in the spring, you know, when it, it looks like it's staying above 50 degrees, you know, we can start thinking about parasite transmission. And then when it freezes again in the fall, you know, it'll rest that. And, and we want to do some different things. So in the fall, we want to be sure to deworm those cattle after a, a killing frost sometime. Mm -hmm. That keeps them pretty well clean through the winter. So they come into the spring, they're able to utilize all the nutrients they can off that grass. And then once it gets 50 and, and we've already dewormed, had our worked our cows or cattle and, and we've done our spring vaccinations and our deworming or combo deworming, then sometime during the summer we're going to come back and do the strategic deworming with the non-handling form so we clean them up throughout the entire summer. So, and, All right. and in the south where we very rarely have a killing frost, uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a reverse. We will often have a few weeks of a very hot, dry period. And I, it's a similar kind of thing. So those worms, they, they just arrest, have arrested development. They just mm -hmm. hang out in the uh, mucosal surfaces until something triggers them to get active again. So usually you'll be coming into the fall with those becoming active again and, and starting to mature and, and shed eggs again. So that the timing of that deworming so you can maximize the efficacy of your dewormer is going to be important. That, that's a really good point. So it, it, in the north and the west, especially where I grew up, we talk about killing stuff, you know, mm -hmm. killing free frost and that kind of thing. In his country, it, it's when the grass dries up, mm -hmm. when, you know, so that, that becomes more of a problem than, than what we're talking about in terms of a killing frost. Parasites waiting for their time to cause chaos. Correct. All right. Well, we're going to continue the conversation. And, of course, before we go, we are going to open our phone lines. So that number to call is 877-731-6733. You can call in with your questions. And the team with Merck Animal Health will they will be answering your questions live. Of course, we'll be right back. Stay with us. And welcome back to Rural America Live with Merck Animal Health as we help cattle producers battle internal parasites in their herds. Now, you're an important part of the show, so we want to hear from you. If you have a question or a comment for the team from Merck Animal Health, well, give us a call, 877-731-6733. Our phone lines are open. Now, as we jump back in, uh, Dr. Nichols, Dr. Fuselay, uh, talk just briefly, if you would, about your own role in tech services. What exactly... Does sure. that entail? So it, it varies. A, a lot of different things that we do. One of the you know, main things that we do is we help the sales staff mm -hmm. in different accounts, especially if they've got a problem in a specific account. We'll go whether do you need a veterinarian on a health issue or a nutritionist, you know, on, on a management or nutrition type um, problem, um, growth problem for nutritionists. Um, we give a lot of continuing education talks around the country for veterinarians and nutritionists. Uh, we also monitor all our trials. Um, that we do, and it's it's a variety of different trials from vaccine to growth promotants and things. So they keep us very busy traveling, and, and basically we visit a lot. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Anything you'd like to add there, Dr. Peasley? Yeah, so we get, to, we get to see several parts of the country and, and the struggles that each, <clears throat> and plus the things that, that they do well, and that we can help share some of that with, with other parts as we travel. And um, it kind of problem solvers is a way to look at it. And there's a lot of, spend a lot of time visiting with other veterinarians that are just kind of as a sounding board and um, help them with diagnostics and, and other things to help them figure out what's going on and what can be done about it and how do we prevent it in the future going forward. So, Now, we talked about this also a little bit beforehand as far as uh, things and challenges and parasites and how folks work with them and work with their herd varies by region, varies by country, <clears throat> countryside, but also probably by farmer ranch. Do you guys have any examples for us? Well, <laughs> I don't know if we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> that means I want to hear them. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, you know, we'll work with the veterinarian, local veterinarians and, and find out what the problems are within that 
within that specific geographical area, same on the nutrition side. Uh, and, and yes, we can go out and, you know, a guy thinks he might be having a problem and he might be doing just fine, you know. And then as I think Dr. Fuselay talked about some of his experience, you know, and he can talk about it. As, okay, I think that animal is wormy and that one's not. And they, you know, really, there's you can't tell. Mm -hmm. No, there's no way to do that. But we get a lot of those kind of things. So, so Doc, tell me, well, what, what's wrong with that cow over there? Mm. You know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. So, got a story to share? No, it's just that's that's exactly it. There's <laughs> a lot of these smaller forms we go to, and I, I, all through practice, that that was a yeah. common question and say, what does your deworming program look like? And a lot of it was, well, I deworm them when they look wormy and spot deworm. If I bring one into the chute, she's not getting out without getting a dewormer because she might need it. Uh -huh. And you know, those, those things happen often. And, and the more we study this, the more we follow the performance that comes from it, we realize how that's a very bad thing to do, especially as we try to find mm -hmm. sources of this resistance that's growing. That, that, that's not helping anything. Uh -huh. so. so I can tell you kind of a funny story. We, we uh, took some some of our internal people and we brought them out to Texas and we, we were on this ranch and I don't know why we picked this one but it happened to be close to Amarillo and we're riding around in this bus and, and talking to this manager and we get to visiting about <clears throat> his cattle and what he does and he says you know he says that white stuff you put in their mouths says that don't work he says, you know and the little pellets you know you put in there ah that stuff don't work and so we got to say well what does work he said, diatomaceous earth. There you go. <laughs> so we just started laughing. So how much do you use? He said, oh, I throw a coffee can or two on every load. <laughs> That's so, not something I've ever heard before. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, so those kind of things we run into all the time. Right, you know, right. You know, just folk, folk tales. Mm -hmm. and Folklore kind of, and yeah. fix it that way. Now, again, our phone lines are open, so give us a call. 877-731-6733 is the number to call if you have a question or comment for our guest. Now, Dr. Nichols, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we were talking a little bit about deworming and that it has a profound effect on cattle health and performance just simply overall. But why is fall such an important time for us to deworm? Well, the fall, so and we talked about that 26 to 28 mm -hmm. degrees, you know, in the country that, that has, a, has, a, has that kind of a, a weather pattern. So once, once it hits that, then that, that arrests the transmission. So those, those, that larva is not hatching, it's not going up those grass sleeves, um, and the cattle are not being reinfected. So if I can deworm the cattle at that time, then we've got several months that those cattle are going to be free of parasites. Or not free of parasites, but a very low parasite load where we can get the most nutrition out of those, those animals of what, what they're consuming. And So if I'm feeding hay, I'm getting the most out of that hay that I can during that winter without those parasites interrupting that that process. Mm -hmm. So if we can do it early in the fall like that, it keeps a very low parasite load throughout the winter. And then when we come back in the spring, we're going to work our cows, we're going to give them a combination deworming at that time. And then during the summer, we're going to do it again with a non-handling form. So it's very important to try to clean those cattle up before the winter, winter hits. And then jocks are in the southeast. It's totally different. Yeah. <laughs> but, back to, but still with that, if it's a spring calving mm -hmm. herd, um, mm -hmm. trying to get, get ahead of that arrested development like you were mm -hmm. talking about. And so you have fewer mature worms on the, on the spring side. But at that same time, is when cows are going to be calving. And it's known that there's a, a rise in uh, egg count mm -hmm. production at, at around the time of calving. And so <clears throat> not only are you doing that, if, if you... If you have a lot of parasites in this cow coming into the spring, which she's about to calve, the amount of egg shedding is going to greatly increase. And then now she's going to have this young calf on the ground and she's going to be susceptible. So she's going to pick up more and her herd mates will. Mm -hmm. And these baby calves are going to start picking them up and they start to graze. It's just, it's a lot going back on that pasture. So if you can get a good worm deworming done in the fall, that reduces that amount that's going to be shed at that time, of, mm -hmm. important time of the year when the spring comes. Right. That also yeah. helps keep condition on the cow so that she she breeds back in a, in a timely manner. Right. We get more milk production, more weaning weight, and those kind of things. Just just keeping them parasite free. And ready you know, to go. And ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, the phone lines are open. You can give us a call, 877-731-6733 is the number to call. And we happen to have David. He is from Tennessee on the line with us. David, go ahead with your question or comment. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not hearing these gentlemen mention anything about rotating the dewormers. I have horses. I do not have cows. 
but I, I rotate my words. I'm seeing things written that it's not necessary, and I hear there say, yes, it is necessary, and it's rather confusing. But is it necessary to rotate your dewormers with horses? I, I do my own fecal egg counts, and uh, I stay up on that, but I'm just wondering about it. Yeah, so I've probably done as much trial work on horses as anybody. My wife and I, she's a professor at Texas Tech University, and, and we've done a ton of, of work in equine um, on parasitism. Um, and I can tell you, yes, rotate your dewormers. So, you know, what I, like in Kentucky, you know, you can do it six times a year. That's not going to happen in most places, but at least four times a year. So, you know, we can start with the power pack and, and call it January. Three months later, I'm going to give them an ivermectin. Three months later, I'm going to come back and give them a safeguard. And three months after that, I'll give them Quest plus Proziquantel in the fall. And that would be my four times a year and rotating my dewormers throughout. And, and yes, you're doing the exact thing you need to be, rotate those dewormers the, through. They tick it, however. Is you, you don't rotate brand names. It's more important to rotate active ingredients. So if you're listening to the types of dewormers Dr. Nichols was talking about, it's, you, you have totally different types of, of mechanisms of actions whenever you go from one type to the next. If you just do brand names, uh, you might be given an avermectin each time, and that's not accomplishing what you're after. And I want to clarify, he was talking about horses, mm -hmm. and so specifically in the, the horses of the equine industry, you're talking about doing that rotation? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Well, David, David, so, like, like Dr. Fuselay talked about, so you're going to rotate your benzimidazoles with your ivermectins. So we we're going to start with a power pack, which is which is benzimidazole, two exit dose for five days. We're going to come back three months later and give them a, a, an ivermectin of some kind. And then we're going to come back three months later and give them a, another benzimidazole. And then in the fall, we're going to come back. With, and I would highly suggest Quest plus Proziquantel in the fall. You're going to have to write that down for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and spell it. Well, again, that's a good question for us to have. That was David out of Tennessee there. And we are going to continue our calls. Again, the number to call is 877-731-6733. Now, with that, let's go to Aaron from Tennessee as well. And that's where consulting veterinarian Dr. Mark Turney uh, conducted an on-pasture deworming trial in stalker cattle. Just how much can internal parasites impact an animal's health and growth? That's the question veterinarian Mark Turney wanted to answer. What drove this was actually some, some problems that we were seeing in, in local producers. We were seeing cattle that towards the end of summer were just, uh, just unthrifty. And we were thinking, oh, what, what disease process is going on? And sometimes it's the simplest things. And the simple thing as our parasite control wasn't right. And so it, it got us to thinking, what can we do? What can we implement that, that can help this process? Dr. Turney conducted an on-pasture deworming trial in stalker cattle to try and find some answers to his parasite questions. We followed two groups of cattle that were separated. There was 50 in each group. They were grazed during this 73-day period, and they were uh, both groups were treated identical, except group one was fed at day 28 and then at day 56, a feed-through safeguard dewormer. Dr. Fuseli, you got a reaction to that? Yeah, so that's uh, another neat thing that, that Merck Animal Health has. It would, we have you know, everybody. A lot of people are familiar with the shoot side type mm -hmm. of application, where you know, a drench type of thing. Where we have other forms of uh, fenbenazole, mm -hmm. so it can come as a feed form in the minerals, you know, range cubes, protein blocks, you name it. There's several different applications, and what he uses is one that was mixed in the feed, which uh, made it very handy. It, it's you put it out with the feed, cattle eat it, um, it less labor. So if you you don't always have to bring them up. A lot of it just depends on what's going to work best mm -hmm. for your operation at the time of year that you need to apply this dewormer. No reason to stress the herd or stress yourself if you don't have to in these That's instances. Correct. So That's correct. Cattle do like the feed bunk, so to <laughs> put them to work there. Now, with that, we have Maurice. He is on the phone line with us out of Texas. So, Maurice, let's uh, turn things over to you. Go ahead with your question or comment. Maurice? All right. Thank you. It's Madisonville, Texas. And Dr. Nichols had mentioned L1, L2, and L3, and that caught me off guard. I didn't quite understand what that meant. 
That's it. That, that is just the progression of maturation of the, of the parasite itself. So once it hatches out of the egg, it's got to go through those different stages to become a larval stage that that, that that animal can pick up on that blade of grass. So it goes through L1, L2, L3. It's just a progression of, like in humans, going from adolescence to teenager to adult. It's, that's, that's all that is. All right, Maurice, thanks for your call. And with that, we stay in Texas. And we have Daryl on the line with us out of the Lone Star State. Daryl, go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, down here in southeast Texas, we're, unlike most of the time, uh, we're fighting liver flukes, um, either on the dry stage or on the wet stage. Um, I was wondering what the recommendation was for liver flukes. Gentlemen? Yes, I'll take that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> We had talked about with these other worms, we're talking about the life cycle and how important it is to tailor your, your treatment with the life cycle. And there's a, there's a different life cycle when it comes to flukes. There's, with, there's an, an intermediate that has to happen, and that's a snail. So that if, the, if a cow has flukes and the flukes are shedding eggs, it will go through the feces just like the intestinal worms do. But once those eggs hatch, it has to be picked up by this snail and then... Uh, Several weeks go by and several uh, juvenile infective larvae come out of the snail and then the cow ingests that and then another several weeks go by before it becomes mature. The type of dewormers we have available to us in the United States only is efficacious against the mature flukes. And so the, the snail season is going to be, especially in your part of the world, going to be from basically April through July. And... Um, so if the cattle are picking up those infective larvae at that time, we're looking at October before you have a first chance to be able to have an impact on the mature uh, flukes. And the two products that we have in the United States is albendazole and uh, chlorchilon. Uh, albendazole goes under the trade name of uh, valbazin, and chlorchilon is going to be the plus in Ivermec Plus. And, if, and so work with the veterinarian as far as which one of those is the best to put into your, your program. But the fall time would be the best time. Late fall, early, early winter is the best time to try to attack those uh, mature flukes. I think I need to emphasize that the only thing we have today gets mature flukes. We don't have anything on the market that, that would get an immature fluke. We, we used to, but they took it off the market. A full dose of Corsalon would get an immature fluke, but we can no longer get that. So we're to, down to these two products mm -hmm. that only get the mature fluke. All right. Well, Daryl, thank you very much for that question. We appreciate it. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and visit with our guest. Uh, Dr. Fuselay here just a moment ago, we talked a little bit that you don't always have to bring the cowherd up into the chute to actually have them give them the treatments that they might need. But you guys have a variety of products that help folks not have to do that. Can you kind of run through those for us? Sure. So it's always great if you can mm -hmm. have them caught and, and drench them. And get a close eye on yeah, them, too. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but if you can do that, it's, it needs to be weight appropriate. So you really need to get a good handle on the weight of the cattle and, and drench them that way. The feed forms is just another formulation. Like I said, you can have its pellets as a top dress. You can have it protein blocks that'll you know, serve 8,000 pounds of cattle. You can have um, some that's in, in, integrated in the feed, some that's in the mineral. And based on... How you normally handle your cattle, what, what program you have, it, find the one that, that fits. There's lots of opportunities there and put it in and they, uh, looks like they'll nice, eat it and they, they deworm themselves. Yeah, it looks like a nice little round table of, of products that you have. <laughs> right. I'd kind of bring it at all, at least in the visual form there. The one thing I will say that's not often talked about is these products have a withdrawal period, whether it be a milk withdrawal period for dairy cattle or a meat withdrawal period for beef cattle. And so it's important that to pay attention to the label, feed it according to the label, and observe those withdrawal periods based on label recommendations. Now, talking about those feed forms, why are the feed forms so, ex so effective? Well, the, the cattle, gonna, they eat it, they kind of mm -hmm. deworm themselves. They eat based on what they normally eat. And there's uh, that molecule, feminazole, um, it shuts down these little tubules in the worm that allows for glucose metabolism. So they, they basically starve to death, but it doesn't have any effect on the mammalian host of the cow. Mm -hmm. Once it gets into the worm, it, it is not excreted from the worm. 
So if they have se if the cow has several meals, it's going to continually accumulate in the worm until it reaches a lethal dose, and then the, the worm is going to be shed out in the feces. Um, so, How, so go ahead. I can say so. Well, that animal is say the block. You know, she may eat a little bit one day and come back in, a, in another couple of days and consume a little bit more. But as she's consuming that block, it's putting that fenbendazole into that parasite mm -hmm. at a little bit at a time until it gets to, like Dr. Fusilay says, the, that lethal dose, and then it kills the parasite. And one thing about fenbendazole or, or Safeguard, it's, it's a quick, I mean, we, we get to clean them up, especially with drench in 24 hours. <clears throat> so it's a quick kill, even though, you know, it's starving those parasites, mm -hmm. basically, you know, they can't metabolize glucose, so they basically starve, and we clean them up. But it, it is held in that parasite until we get to a lethal dose. And that's how these uh, formulations work, these non-handling. We did a, just finished a, start, a trial in Idaho where we used the pellets, a one-day feeding, and well, another well-randomized and replicated study. And, and by the end of that 100 days, we had a 17-pound difference, and we used the pellets to mm -hmm. deworm those cattle out on pasture. So, you know, there's some... Um, Concern that the cattle might not consume what they need to, but according to our fecals that we run behind all these cattle, they're consuming enough to get get cleaned up, all of them for the most part. Right. If you so, look at our database, we can be talking over 24,000 samples that's mm -hmm. been sent in over time. And once we go back and we plug in what type of dewormer was used, the feed forms are almost at the same level as the, the drench. So you had 95 plus percent efficacy in all feed forms taken together versus 98 in the in the drench so it's uh, very effective now what kind of return can producers seed from using the feed and also the mineral formulations together well pounds paid <clears throat> okay right? and so you're gonna get an increase in pounds an increase in weight and um, <clears throat> there's several studies that's out there you can find where it's a range anywhere from 20 to 44 pounds at weaning advantage if, if they're properly dewormed uh, if you look at Dr. Turney's uh, trial that we we highlighted, you know he put it, it was at a cost of roughly two dollars per head given twice, and with an increase of about um, thirty-five to forty dollars per mm -hmm. head advantage. So it's a eight to one ratio. And it looks like the it. graphic on the screen is showing some pretty good numbers there. Yes, so that that shows the efficacy of our safeguard feed pro, um, formulations of and fecal egg count reduction. You know, we're we're way up over ninety percent. And on the return on investment, you know, if we look at that Idaho trial, we got seventeen pounds, which is about thirty-five dollars. It cost us about five dollars to do the two dewormers at twenty-eight and fifty-six. You t take five away from thirty-five is thirty divided by five is a six to one return on investment. So it, it, it is highly efficacious and worth your, worth your time. It is definitely worth checking into. Well, we are going to continue our conversation. We're going to take another break first, but of course, also again, the phone lines are open, so give us a call with your questions. We want to hear from you. Join the call tonight. 877-731-6733. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Rural America Live. Having the best practices in place will help when it comes to keeping your herd parasite free and Merck Animal Health. Well, they're here to tell us how they recommend that you do it. Well, with that, we are going back to our phone lines. Again, the phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. And we have Jack on the line with us. He is out of Kansas. Jack, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, while I was on hold, you answered the question I had around knowing that all the animals are going to consume some of those medicated feed products. But uh, being on hold, give me a minute to think of another question. And I, I was curious your take on this term, refugia, and not treating some of the animals versus <laughs> treating all of the animals like we've been used to doing, or say treating animals based on a body condition score or age. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Okay, yeah. so yeah, that's it. So that's a very good question, and we're going to get into a highly controversial topic. So I'm sure we're going to get all kinds of calls on this, but I am not a believer in refugia. There's no reason that to, in my mind, to leave parasites that we I know we can kill. So they use an example of, and if you can picture this, they have three um, parasites that are resistant and they want to leave other parasites with them so the next time you come in <clears throat> with a 
at the minute, you know, you're going to get a 90% kill, but you're not changing that resistant parasite. He is still there. All you're doing is leaving more parasites out there to go with them. So if we, you know, if you go back to genetics 101 and, and I have a heterozygous, um, two heterozygous animals and I breed them together, I'll get 25% that are homozygous dominant, I'll get 50% that are heterozygous, and I'll get 25% that are homozygous recessive. So all I'm doing is leaving those parasites out there to create more resistance in my mind. And, and I know it's a controversial topic. There has not been one study in the United States that showed anything about refugia dealing in one thing positive, but heck, there's not been a trial. The only trials that came out are from... Go ahead. I mean, from what I understand, oh. I understand that you guys have quite a bit of information available for you on the website. And so uh, specifically on that very topic, so you can go to safeguardworks.com where they can dig in a little bit deeper on the subject matter, it seems like. <laughs> uh, with that, the phone lines are open and thank you very much, Jack, for that call. We appreciate it. That was Jack out of Kansas. Safeguardworks.com is where you can dig up some more details there. With that, we move on through. And you guys were talking about during the break that uh, you guys have introduced several new products on the market so give us a rundown here yeah so we do have a very active research and development um, arm and within Merck and they are constantly looking for new products and things to develop that will help the cattle industry um, you know we can look at new vaccines and antibiotics and growth promotants and those things um, and on the other side we acquired a company called Allflex and we are now one company and we're doing a lot of different things with technology um, we have a, a, a tag that we're developing that has an algorithm in it that can tell that an animal's sick before a pen rider can actually find that animal. And, and I think it's going to be um, very well used in the industry once we get it to a place that we can do it. And the other one that we have that I'm highly excited about is called Vents. And it's a virtual fencing um, technology where we can put the collars on these cows and we can put them, use them, and, and the, like a dog fence in a yard, mm -hmm. so we can put them in there and, and they won't cross this this line that we put in. We can move cattle around in different pastures and not have to build fence and those kind of things. I'm pretty excited about that one, especially out west, you know, where we have a lot of BLM and forest right. service ground and, and those kind of things. I think it's gonna be a boon to the industry. Very interesting. Now, we were talking also a little bit about the, the good practices for deworming cattle throughout the year. What are a couple of other things that we need to keep in mind to have a successful program on the hump farm? And take that one. Well, there's first off, if you're going to be deworming, you need to yeah. do it strategically. Yeah. You need to make sure that you're doing it at the time of the year where you're going to get the biggest impact, like we, we mentioned earlier. Uh, pasture management's also important. The nutrition. Um, it, we need it. We need that gut moving. We need it by having that happen. Yeah, you know, that that's harder for worms to to survive in. Mm -hmm. um, so good nutrition on pastures, so take care of the pasture. Make sure you, uh, if you want to try rotational grazing, work with somebody that can explain the right way to do it so that you don't put too much pressure on the pasture. That, if it's done properly, does minimize some of the uh, parasite load that they'll be experiencing whenever they come back to that portion of the pasture and things like that. So mm -hmm. visiting with a veterinarian is not a good way, nutritionist is a good way to try to help tailor some of these other management practices besides just deworming. Now yeah. we had a call. Whoops, go ahead. I was going to say that the other aspect is accurate dosing. Uh -huh. Make sure we, we dose to the to the weight of the animal. So if if we underdose, and you know we can cause some of these resistant kind of things, so we're not given enough to actually kill all the parasites. So accurate dosing by weight is very important. Now earlier we had a, a phone call where they were asking about using multiple products specifically for horses. But what about in our cattle herd, Dr. Fuselli? Is that something that we should keep in mind there too? It's definitely something to look into. Okay. Um, other countries like Australia, they, they do it very often. Um, one benefit is it does slow down the development of resistance. These you know, parasites have been around before us and they can be around long after us, but they're not that sophisticated to the point that they can create resistance to two different molecules at the same time. So if you use it strategically and you use it at the same time, two different classes, mainly uh, benzimidazole, like a white worm, like Safeguard, mm -hmm. and one of the indecticides, so the avermectin type of poron or something, uh, they work synergistically, and, and it, you, we consistently get r roughly a 99% uh, reduction in, in fecal egg shedding, mm -hmm. which, is, which is fantastic. And they kind of, 
You know, each molecule has its, its own fault. You know, it's one type of parasite where it just doesn't do as well as some of the others. Well, by having them together, you're not knowing what the main species in the, the population in your herd, you make sure that you, you have a broader spectrum, um, more efficacious deworming by using two molecules at the same time. And how important is it for us to keep an idea on the, the timing for that deworming? So that's where, like we spoke about earlier, you want to make sure, if, you don't want to do it in the dead of the winter if you're in an area <laughs> where you have a killing frost. You don't want to do it in the heat of the summer in the south where there's no such thing. Um, you really want to do it whenever they're active. So sometime in the spring, sometime in the fall, are going to be very important times before going into these arrested development states, uh, whenever they're just coming out of those and they're a few weeks into the pasture. I also, think about the calves. You know, spring turnout when you turn cows out, you know, a couple months after, six to eight weeks after is a mm -hmm. good time to think about. And as their calves are growing, they get two to three months old, they're going to be grazing and taking some of those in, and the life cycle is very fast in those calves. So. And that's where we get back into where you can test to see how efficient all the th all, everything is, your program has been. Now, the FECRT test, is that's what it's called, correct? Right. Okay, now we've got the FECRT test, and we've got that uh, graphic on the screen that we can pull up right there. And, of course, this is a QR code. Now, you can scan this. What is the cost for folks to scan this QR code to get the FECRT test, gentlemen? Three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, nothing. The cost yeah. of the phone. Yeah. There you go. There your you time, go. Whatever your time is. Worth. And how often do they need to do a FECRT test? Well, I'll leave that with them and the veterinarian to decide. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my personal opinion would be um, before each, at least twice a year, uh -huh. before each major deworming, like coming out of the winter, going into the winter, would be a great time to see before it's too late when you still have a chance to to make a, a change and, and get another dewormer out there, whether it be put out another one of these non-handling feed forms or uh, try a totally different approach. And we'll so bring that up for you here one more time shortly. Go it's ahead. It's also nice, so when, when we use the non-handling forms and, and we want to check and see how well we did in that particular time period, mm -hmm. so we'll take a, a fecal sample prior to putting those things out on the pasture, let them consume, and then 14 days later we'll come and take another one just, just to test to see how well we've done in our deworming practices. Give yourself a pat on the back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pull that QR code up there one more time. We want to give you a chance to get that. That is how you can access your own FECRT test to put into work right there on your farm or ranch. Now, again, you can use the camera on your cell phone, or if you have a QR, QR app, you can use that as well, and it'll pull up a website. Gentlemen, very, very short. We're winding things down. Give us kind of a 30 seconds, uh, less, less thought. So Deworming and the use of anthelminics is probably one of the best practices you can do to improve your the margin in your cattle and the health in your cattle. Like we said, we want to get all the nutrition we can through that animal and not have something rob it like a parasite. All right, Dr. Fusley? It's important to make sure you get the right dose in them, mm -hmm. do it at the right time, and your cows will pay you in growth and reproduction. Okay. And again, they can find more information online. You can go to safeguardworks.com for more information. And of course, there will also, I'm assuming, be a link that they could probably pull up that QR code at that time. But safeguardworks.com is where you want to check in too. Gentlemen, it's been a great conversation. Of course, right now, as we get to wind down fall, head into the cooler winter months, but then we can plan ahead for spring so we can hopefully have a really popping spring calving season. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here for Rural America Live. Good night from Rural America's most important network. Thank you, gentlemen.